Welcome to our digital stage. My name is Ashley Gordon. And I'm Anthony Green. And we are co-founders of Castle of Our Skin. Thank you for tuning in to our fourth installment of our Founders Chat series, where we sit down with really true movers and shakers in the arts. So today we have Angelica Hairston, as well as Jessica Stinson uh, from Challenge the Stats. And Challenge the Stats, or CTS for short, exists to empower artists of color by creating communities devoted to diversity, inclusion, and equity in the classical performing arts. CTS seeks to equip audiences and artists, both equal parts, with the tools needed to advocate for justice, both inside and outside of the concert hall. A lot of that mission sounds very resonating with with Castle of Our Skins. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you both for being here. Obviously, thank you for your work. Um, and just so that everyone who's watching can understand the fabulous energies that you bring, can you introduce yourselves? Um, tell us where you're from, where you currently live, anything about your musical, creative journey, your background, anything that you would like to share to help give a little context. So um, maybe Angelica, if you want to start, and then Jessica. Yeah, absolutely. It is so fabulous to be here. I am really, really thrilled to be chatting. I feel like we're like BFFs. We're all just like kindred spirits in this world of creating our new little tables in, in the field. So really thrilled, um, again, to be a part of this. Um, I actually grew up in Atlanta which is where I currently am and currently um, Challenge the Stats is also based. And so I am a harpist, surprise, surprise, by this large piece of furniture that sits behind me. Um, but I started playing the harp in sixth grade and I continued on in that journey. I went on to Toronto and we'll get into that story, I'm sure, uh, later. But a lot of things happened that really kind of shifted my focus um, and I ended up deciding that Challenge the Stats was really going to be the focal point of my career. And so um, we'll sort of talk through that story more, I'm sure, but it was really a point in my life where I decided that I wanted to use my artistry and my ability, my knowledge, my understanding of, of the classical music space and really find a way to merge it into um, the world of justice. It's like, what, what was that intersection? How can we find um, that point where these two things come together and create something magical. So uh, that was my time that I spent in Boston and ended up moving back to sunny Atlanta, um, where I am now and super grateful to be able to work alongside wonderful board member and CTS artist Jessica. Thank you. Um, this I, It is such a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, I also, like Angelica, was um, raised in Atlanta and still live in Atlanta. Um, I did leave for, for school and, and came back um, after graduate school. Um, I started playing the violin, I'm a violinist, I um, started playing the violin when I was three years old. So it's basically been a fixture of my life for as long as I can remember. Um, but as, as I'm sure many of us have felt, you know, as I've kind of gone along um, my career path, the need for meaning and connection became clearer and clearer and clearer as I went through school. And of course, after school, just trying to figure out what, what, does, what does this all mean? Like, why, why do we do this? How do we, um, you know, find meaning in this, especially as people of color? Um, and getting connected with Angelica was, it seems like kind of a, you know, it was almost like meant to be. <laughs> um, I felt like I knew her from the moment that I met her. And it has just been a tremendous blessing in my life to be part of CTS's mission and to help it, you know, move along in Atlanta. So I'm just so grateful to be here today as part of this chat and just grateful to be a part of the general conversation. Yeah, and, and we are obviously very excited um, to have you both here. I read uh, CTS's mission, and, and Jessica, you referenced that, and I want to dig deeper into the mission and, and also the concept of Challenge the Stats, how it came about. So um, Angelica, I first connected with CTS um, in 2016 with your Boston launch. 
um, Javier Caballero, a mutual friend of ours, had, had put me in touch of this concert. Uh, you were at Northeastern University doing a Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Graduate Fellow in Master of Music Industry Leadership, uh, which, is, which is a lot to unpack and I'm sure has a lot of influence in the work that you're doing. But I wonder if you can um, help illuminate a little bit the impetus for that concert. It was the Boston launch. Now Challenge of Stats is in Atlanta and certainly continuing the work there. But what ultimately was the inspiration for that project, that concert, the mission behind uh, CTS and, and the work that you do today? Yeah, that's a great question, a loaded question. We could talk about that for the next 45 minutes, but we won't. Um, short answer to a very long story. Uh, I you know, was in Toronto doing my undergraduate degree before I got to Boston. And while I was there, I had a one track mind and I was gonna play an orchestra. That was it, that was the goal. I had nothing else in my mind um, that, I, that I wanted to do with my career. And while I was there working on my you know, Mozart and practicing my trills and getting everything so perfect, um, the news of Trayvon Martin came to the surface in the United States. And so I'm sitting in this practice room, right? Like in Toronto, practicing these trills. And I could tell you about Pagetores all day long, but I didn't know what my music meant in the space of justice when my people were being murdered. And I'm sitting in this school, one of the only people of color, very small number of black people, a uh, very small number, especially of black women. And there were a lot of people who wanted to have discussions around what was going on. And I had no vocabulary. I had no tools. I had never had this kind of a conversation in conservatory spaces. And so I really wanted to, to explore that more. I wanted to learn, I wanted to grow. Um, so I ended up in Boston doing a Master of Music Industry Leadership, big fancy word for basically music business degree. And um, while I was there, I uh, linked up with a professor named Margot Sommier, and she and I um, sat together and I literally went to her and said, I'm interested in you know, the issues around police brutality and I'm interested in classical music. And I don't, I don't know how to, to mold this into anything. So uh, she took me under her wing, we explored it together, and we just did a concert. It was just going to be a concert. It was not going to be an organization. It was just, I want to play some fun music with my friends who are wonderful artists of color. I wanted to highlight the work of musicians of color. And, and that was kind of it. But this small concert um, really kind of blew up. There was a community of support that came around it. There were partners, there were um, support from the university system. There was support from um, larger organizations in Boston. And I started to realize that there was something here and that people were so intrigued around this work and around um, sort of this space that, that Castle of Our Skins also had been exploring and navigating. And I figured, well, you know, what's next? Why stop here? Why make it one concert? Uh, so I ended up moving back to Atlanta and um, taking a job with the Urban Youth Harp Ensemble where I do some similar work in terms of creating equity around um, access and opportunity for, for black students primarily around the harp. And uh, we found amazing partners here who helped us really get off the ground and launch. And the Atlanta launch happened and here we are years later sort of continuing this work of exploring the issues that are disproportionately affecting communities of color. We really try and target into Atlanta to look at what's happening in our city on a local level and then find ways to really program around all of those realities um, that people of color face within um, our city um, and finding ways for music to speak into that. That is such an incredible story. And it's really heartwarming to know that within such a relatively short amount of time, CTS has gone on to become a rather successful and necessary entity within current classical music practices. So thank you so, so much for all of the work that you are doing. Um, I would love to have you talk about your programming and how you are blending the situations that are going on in the world, socio socially, politically, et cetera, with the 
programming um, aspect of Challenge to Stats. And if you could, can you also share some memorable moments that you've had, perhaps stories of the audience reaching out to you and members of the community reaching out to you about your work? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and one that I'll definitely have Jessica hop in as well on. Um, you know, for, for us being a small organization, the beauty of that is we can be nimble. Um, and we can really adjust and respond to what is happening um, currently in our times, which we've certainly done um, and continue to do during COVID-19. But even prior, um, in our first Atlanta launch, we were looking at this idea of the school to prison pipeline. Um, and how do we dismantle that? What, what are the underlying reasonings uh, behind this, this system um, that is disproportionately affecting students of color. And so um, we really reached out to some amazing partners in the city, the Atlanta Music Project, um, brought a, a huge group of students to, to perform as part of that space. Um, and we also commissioned um, Joelle Thompson to write a piece, um, Songs from Prison, that actually took the words of um, current individuals within the criminal justice system and set that to music for Harp and Tenor. Um, and so it's, it's through this programming where we're not only creating space to perform, but creating space for discussion. And so our programming always aims not only for people to enjoy sort of this space, but what's the conversation that you have in the car on the way home with the person that you came with? What's the conversation that you have the next day? What's the action step that you take um, to actually implement? So we're not just here to entertain, but we're here to really challenge. We're here to provoke. We're here to move the narrative forward. Um, and I know, you know, Jessica has been with us, you know, from the, from the very time that we were in Atlanta performing. And um, last year, we were, we were looking at the issue of homelessness in the city of Atlanta. And so I wonder, Jessica, if you would speak a little bit to sort of performing and take what you need. Um, and also uh, with Preeti, um, our Hindustani Indian vocalist who joined us. And yes, yeah, so it, that was, that concert was an incredible experience for everyone that was involved. Uh, I think that we were all, um, the, the Challenge to Stat String Quartet, um, of which I'm a member, um, we, we were all moved to tears in when we performed with the, um, with the homework choir. And these men came forward and shared their stories of how music has, you know, given them such joy amidst a lot of trouble, a lot of hardship, and affirmed their humanity. Um, and it was such, just such an amazing thing to be a part of. And the energy, I remember the energy in the space was incredible. You could tell the audience was just so moved by what was happening. It's so easy in a big city like Atlanta. Um, to you know you're going you're going 100 miles an hour all the time and it's so easy to ignore this problem that is is everywhere this issue that is all over atlanta and in that space in that moment it was just profound to see us all kind of come together through through music which was just tremendous for for all of us um and on that same concert, we worked with um, Preeti, who is a Hindustani classical vocalist. And that was actually a, for, it was one of those affirming moments for me as a musician, because it, when we first tried to go through this piece, um, we, it was like we were speaking two different languages because her, um, her approach to even her notation. I, I saw she had a sheet of paper with her and I was able to kind of see it from where I was sitting. And there were all of these symbols and things on there that I had never seen before. And I was I was like, what, what is this? And she would be like, you know, this part where I do this thing and she would start singing and we were just like, we, we don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but over the next, I would say, you know, 20, 30 minutes, we started to really connect to the point where we almost were able to kind of feel where the other person was in the piece. So even in the spots where we were a little bit confused or a little bit lost, we were able to, to connect a lot more, even though we weren't 
a hundred percent sure like what the other person was doing all the time it was it was such a, a tremendous experience and in that moment in the concert as well you know her voice is just powerful and and beautiful and and so different from you know anything that most of us have experienced before so it was just um such a wonderful experience and an opportunity that i don't think i would have had through any other project yeah and even just to follow up on that jessica you know i think with the work of cts we really want people to feel some sense of discomfort Mm -hmm. um, because growth is on the opposite side of that discomfort. And so not only for our audience to sit in something and say, I have never quite experienced seeing a string quartet responding to this style of music in this kind of a classical music space, mm -hmm. um, is really that idea of how do we continue to challenge the narrative of what's normal in the classical music field? What is a classical music audience? What does it mean to bring our whole selves, our whole culture, our whole experiences into these spaces so that we can redefine what classical music actually is? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, yeah, I, I definitely just applaud the way that the String Quartet, every year we throw these crazy challenges at everyone. Um, but, but it's the goal not only to have audiences grow, but also our, audi our artists as well to sort of be challenged and to be pushed um, alongside in that change. Beautiful, and that that really ties into some things that I've that I've read um, that you've written, um, and I just wanted to share them because I think they're so succinct in how how you've clarified that chamber music can serve as a model of unity and acceptance, where members work in solidarity toward a common goal of excellence in light of their differences. And I think Jessica, your example um, really helps to illustrate that. And then in terms of the, the audience's conversations around in, in inclusion and social justice among a diverse group of patrons could really be sparked from a CTS um, concert. So I think Angelica, you really spoke to that. Um, I'm, I'm wondering since you have a dual perspective, certainly more perspectives as, as performers um, performing internationally, nationally, et cetera, but with Challenge the Stats, starting in Boston and then now being in Atlanta, do you notice those conversations, what's being sparked, the sort of sense of trying to unify work towards unity being different in the Boston musicians that you've worked with the Boston art audiences and the conversations that you've had versus that in Atlanta? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, and I will say I was in Boston just 10 short months. I did my master's in 10 months like a crazy woman. Um, so yeah, it was a little intense, um, but I will say that the difference that I have experienced here in Atlanta, one is the reality that we're in the South, you know, and we have a very different history in terms of the founding of our city, the founding of our state. Um, and one of the things that I really dove into recently was the work of the Fulton County Remembrance Coalition. And so they have partnered with the Equal Justice Initiative um, in researching all of the areas of Georgia, primarily Fulton County though, that have experienced um, racial terror and specifically lynching. And to, to experience their work, and they have been a you know, partner with us in our previous concert, to really look and dive into that and realize that this is the really underbelly that we're addressing. Um, and in the city of Atlanta, I think that people are very um, excited about the work that we do in a very different way than in Boston. There's a different culture here. There's a different energy. There's a different vibe um, in Atlanta. And I think especially working with um, artists of color who are here in Atlanta, there's just a, a different, yeah, a, a different energy around that. I don't know, Jessica, if you want to kind of jump in, in in terms of you've been in Atlanta a little bit longer as a performing artist. Yeah. and sort of what that what that energy feels like here as a black artist yeah, yeah it's you know it's different it um it's different and not what i expected to be honest um you know growing up here as a child as a student totally different experience but when i came back um i did not realize how vastly underrepresented <laughs> we were in the classical music scene in, in Atlanta until I was working in it myself. Um, 
so being a part of of challenge the sats and being able to um collaborate with artists of color that are just out here doing incredible things has been such an affirming experience for me and i think that they would probably say the same thing um i think for um this this last concert that we did which i'm sure um, we're gonna get into in a few minutes um it was uh, it was a really, it's obviously with everything that's been going on in, um, in our country and in the world lately, um, specifically um, in regards to police brutality. Um, this was, I think we had our rehearsal, it was maybe the week after um, Rayshard Brooks was killed. Um, and I actually drive by that exit on the highway. I was driving by that spot on my way to the church to rehearse with the quartet and it just all felt so heavy. And it felt so insurmountably difficult. Um, but then to be in a space where I'm literally surrounded by genius and artistry and these colleagues that I have, it was so, it just, for at least for a moment kind of lifted that burden off of my heart and that and it was just such a wonderful thing and it's such a special thing and i think having most of the artists being connected to atlanta was a really special thing as well and i think it just is a testament to what we can accomplish in the future yeah absolutely i think especially as a leader as well, um, you know, Ahmaud Arbery also happened here in Georgia. And so that story coming to the surface and coming to light as a leader, I remember every time I sat down to write an email about Challenge the Stats, I would start and say, hey, I'm tired. You know, this is hard. Um, I'm not feeling well, but I'm so excited that we can actually use our music and the thing that we know the best to create change in whatever way we can. Um, but even, you know, as we continue to get closer to sort of the, the concert that we, we just launched, it, it just seemed like every single day there was another story. There was another experience, you know, Breonna Taylor coming to the surface and it just was like this weight to even sit down at an instrument just felt like the hardest thing in the world. And so to recognize that as a community, that we were all going to come together to try to create this thing in the midst of us carrying all of the realities on our backs, um, I think that it allowed us to create something that was a lot more powerful and a lot more authentic. To say that we are all not feeling great. <laughs> we are all feeling the depths of this together, but what does it mean for us to channel that um, into music and into artistry. So I, I think that Atlanta definitely and Georgia as a whole just being impacted so deeply by these issues of police, police brutality um, has allowed us to kind of create a, a different space around music here. Yeah, um, that is super relevant to what's going on right now in the world and it definitely leads into this question about how CTS developed and your own personal relationships with the organization. Um, what have been some other challenges that the programming and the research behind the programming and your community work, what are some of the challenges and growing pains that you've personally experienced behind this type of um, activity that is necessary for challenge the stats to grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the reality is the work that we do, the work that Council of Our Skins does, you know, it's not for everybody. And when we think about funding sources, when we think about the reality of the nonprofit, you know, industrial complex and, and the nature of philanthropy, um, it is certainly a challenge um, to be able to do this work authentically and well um, and to find support um, that really believes in the core of the mission and wants to stand behind us when we are directly addressing systematic injustice. When we are directly speaking out about the realities of our time. And so I think consistently, you know, trying to find that community of support and also help 
you know, our, our donors help the people who support us to continue to grow as well. I'm growing, our artists are growing, our audiences are growing. And so we all kind of have to push forward. But I think the reality of that is it, it also um, just shifts the pool in terms of, of the ways in which you can go about um, finding that level of authentic support um, behind your work. Yeah, um, Jessica, I don't know if you have thoughts that you want to share as a as a board member about organizational challenges and certainly other personal challenges. Um, any any other thoughts that you want to share? Otherwise, I would love to hear more about this concert that you've been alluding to music for the crisis. I, I think that Angelica hit the nail on the head about making sure that everything comes from an authentic place that is in line with um, with the mission of the organization. And I love the fact that that our mission is succinct and clear and it, it makes it easier in a way, but it's in, in some ways it's just, it's, it can be challenging. And I think that we are, you know, like Angelica said, we're, we're growing year after year, you know, as we put these concerts together and as we figure out exactly how to reconcile, um, the give that kind of that tension between wanting to make art and also wanting to um make people uncomfortable a little bit <laughs> so and to make and, and you know make sure that we're not steering away from reality so i think that angelica really really said that very very well absolutely yeah i think to answer you know your sort of last question about this mystery concert. <laughs> um, so it, to kind of uh, backtrack a little bit, our, um, we had a concert that was planned for March and it was so interesting because things were starting to kind of come to the surface around COVID and some uncertainties and some people were starting to cancel and not. And I, as a leader, you know, I was like, we just have to push ahead. We just have to do it. We just have to keep moving forward. We've worked so hard. I mean, we had worked so hard. The artists had their rep. It was literally the week of, I had left an interview um, with a radio station talking about the concert and I got a call and the venue said, nah, we, we've got to sort of cancel all of the events. And I had to take a deep breath and channel all of my frustration and then really stop and think, okay, so what can we do? If we have to cancel our concert in an in-person space, um, we moved it to uh, June with the hopes that COVID would be two weeks, right? And then like, we'd all be like finished with COVID and the outside would be open again and it would be fine. The outside was not open uh, in June. And um, we really st had to stop and reflect. And the first thing that we did as a team is just slowed our production. Um, because there was just so much going on, um, especially in terms of the disproportionate effect of COVID-19 on Black communities. And we started to see these numbers climb. We saw them climb in Georgia. We saw them climb nationally. And we just couldn't sit around and not use this platform to speak truth, which is what our organization is about, to speak truth to the realities that we're facing communities of color, specifically Black communities, as we saw with those um, statistics. And so uh, we completely shifted everything in a matter of about eight weeks. We changed the programming. Um, we changed the theme and the format. Um, and we really wanted to use it as a space to um, let artists not only perform, but also speak out. Um, and so many of the artists wrote their own um, sort of thoughts that they shared, as well as performing the work of living Black composers. We wanted to feature the work of composers who were experiencing these statistics alongside us. Composers who were losing work due to COVID-19. Composers that we could amplify and highlight and you know, support um, not only by programming their music, but really by bringing these issues to the forefront and connecting the dots um, for everyone who is a part of it. And so, I mean, Jessica, I would love for you to speak just in terms of collaborating with Joelle and what that experience was like um, and performing as a masked performer um, in that space too. Sure. Yeah, it was, um, I actually remember when we had um, that conversation when we were about to do this pivot <laughs> and we, um, and you mentioned, 
the the disparities in communities communities of color in regards to COVID nineteen, and in my mind I was like, yes, that's it because at it's still to this day, but especially at the time, it seemed like no one was talking about this, or it was just kind of a you know a remark off to the side when they were you know reporting the numbers and everything, and it seemed like it was one of those things where you felt like you were kind of yelling at the top of your lungs and nobody was listening. It's like, does, does no one see what's going on here? So I thought it was so important to, to, to highlight that. And, you know, we, I think, um, um, Wilfred, who was, uh, who introduced our piece, our, our violist, um, mentioned his connection to personal connection to COVID-19 and also um, Joelle had a personal connection to to COVID-19 as well and we you know there was a member of the quartet that um, was immunocompromised and you know so we're you know we're feeling this personally we're feeling this in our families we're feeling this in our own homes so we thought that it would be appropriate to perform um, Joelle's piece with masks on and you know you talk about kind of getting out of your comfort zone i mean even just the physical experience of playing with a mask on i don't know if um uh, if any of you have done this it's incredibly uncomfortable um you know you want to you want to breathe you want to and everything you all this hot air and you know you, I, I see that many of us in this conversation are wearing glasses so that that's a whole other issue um so the the physical discomfort and then the the discomfort of just the issue itself it, it really and then the discomfort of the music because the music that we were performing very um it was it was angry it was angry and it was um dissonant at times it was disjunct and um and it was perfect for what we were what we were trying to say and i know that i felt like it was such a, a great opportunity to kind of pour some of my frustration out in a way that made sense to me. Um, so it was such a it was such a great opportunity to 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 highlight something that had been frustrating, um, I think, all of us for for a while, and then to do it in such a visually impactful way with the masks, and you know, and masked musicians in the middle of an empty church. It's like, you know, we're we're dealing with something that none of us have ever dealt with before. So it was a it was a tremendous experience. I'm sure none of us will ever forget. <laughs> forget putting that together. Yeah, definitely yeah. logistically too. I will never forget trying to make sure that we had enough space between performers and time to sort of sanitize the space and I'm running back and forth and it is, it's a whole new performing world. So Angelica was on it. She had her Lysol. She had her, you know, she had her wipes. She, you know, she, she had everybody physically distanced. She was, she was keeping us, she was keeping us safe. So. You know, it's, it's true. Yeah. And even, you know, to think about, we're talking about these disproportionate effects. And so the reality is if something happened, you know, then here we are back in this cycle of yeah. being uncared for um, and disproportionately affected by the healthcare system. So mm -hmm. it's a big responsibility. Definitely. Exactly. Uh, one of the latest headlines that I read was about the state of Maine where 2% of the population are black people and 23% of coronavirus infected are black people. It really makes no sense at all. And this is why we must challenge these stats as your title so aptly says. So I would love to ask the both of you, we are all people that wear multiple hats. Um, I'm pretty sure both of you are not just musicians, organizers, but also friends and relatives and businessmen, uh, sorry, business women, and so on and so forth. So how do you balance all the different personalities within yourself and the different jobs and roles that you play, not only with challenge the stats, but outside of the organization? And how has this balance informed the way you operate? Mm, that's such a good question. I'm going to toss it to Jessica first because she is a mama. 
And that is a whole nother level of reality right now in COVID-19 when, you know, Georgia is going back to school. I know we start up August 3rd. I mean, it's right around the corner. So I'm, I'm going to let you start and then I'll, I'll jump in. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, um, not only do I have a, I have a, a young child, a four-year-old boy, and he is, um, for, I'm kind of grateful that he, kindergarten starts for him next year. And I'm grateful for that because that's another, that's just one more decision that I don't have to make right now. Um, but my, my husband is a public school band director and, you know, he, he went back for, um, he's starting in a new school district this year. So he is in new teacher orientation this year in person. And he is one of the very few, he, his school district is one of the very few in the Atlanta area that is still planning to do in-person instruction. And I'm not happy about it, but that is, you know, that's, a, that's another story for another day. Um, but I think that um, the different roles that, you know, I cycle through on, and, and on a day-to-day -day basis, um, I, there, it's exhausting, but at the same time, um, I think I am, I can say now, maybe I wouldn't have said this two years ago. I think I am a better musician, a better citizen of the world. Um, I am more aware of things that are going on in my community now because I am a mother. Um, I think it is, it was, it was so easy for me when I was younger to just, you know, keep my head down, like Angelica was saying when she was going for that orchestra job, you know, you just put your head down, you're like, this is what I'm doing. You know, everything around me is super messed up, but I'm here, you know, I'm right here. Um, and I can't do that anymore. I, I just, I just can't. Um, I, the world around me will not allow me to do that. And I want my son to see um, that what, what I do and that what his dad does you know, does have an impact on the world. And we're not just, you know, doing this very precious, very um, small detailed thing, but this has an impact on our communities and has an impact on the world. So um, yeah, I would, I can, I can say now that even though, you know, I'm tired a lot, <laughs> um, it's, I feel like, I, I feel that responsibility more and more every single day. I am always amazed by Jessica. Like, it's just, it, it's, it's really incredible, the number of hats that you wear as well and, and how you navigate them with such grace. So um, I think for me, I've been doing a couple of tangible things. Um, one of them, I have been diving into the work of the Nat Ministry, uh, which is actually based here in Georgia, um, a wonderful uh, woman, uh, Trisha Herseys, who has done a lot of research on this idea that taking a break um, and taking a, just literally taking a 10 minute nap as simple as that sounds um, is actually a form of resistance against capitalism. It's a form of resistance around the society that says we have to continue to produce, especially in a time right now where people who wear multiple hats and now we're sort of quarantined and we're dealing with the realities of racial injustice to the surface. It's a lot. And so learning to slow down, learning to stop production um, is really a way that we can push back against sort of this society that says that we have to meet these deadlines regardless of what is on our backs right now, regardless of you know, the oppression um, that people of color face in this society. It really is a way to, to push back at white supremacist systems to say, I am going to stop, I am going to rest, and I'm going to create space to care for my own self, my own body, my own mental health um, before I am actually gonna produce. So uh, Nat Ministry, Chelsea Jackson Roberts, another amazing yogi who I have been like fallen and trying to do my little like downward dog foolishness. I am not a yogi, but trying to just center my wellness and really resist um, this, this idea that we have to continue to produce nonstop, especially as, as black people in this society. Absolutely. I can, I can 100% uh, value the idea of resisting and self-care and treating, putting the, your oxygen mask on first, right before you engage with others and, and prioritizing that finding value. Definitely need to 
re-emphasize that for myself at times, especially because of what society says, but definitely can, can resonate with that. I'm wondering um, with, with all of the work, when you choose to do it, right? Not when society says you, to do it, but all of the work that you're doing, how can people um, catch up to, to what you've done since 2016? Uh, where, where can they find you online? Where can they find the Music for the Crisis um, video, for instance? Like, tweet, share, follow, all of those things. And, and also, how, how can they keep um, in, in touch about future goals? And if you have some future goals and projects in mind to even just put out there as a teaser, that I think would be great to, to share. Yeah, absolutely. That's such a great question. Um, and thank you again for like amplifying our voices and our, um, and our mission. Um, you can definitely find us at challengethestats.org. Um, that kind of houses everything. You're welcome to sign up on our newsletter by going to our contact page um, and also join our community. So Instagram and Facebook um, communities, you can find us at Challenge the Stats. Um, like, share, commenting. I mean, those things really do help and support the work that we do. Um, the Music for the Crisis concert is on our Facebook page. You can also find it on YouTube. It's at about 12,000 views right now. Crazy, what in the world? Um, but again, just, just being a part of our community, um, if you feel so moved to support us through financial support, that is always welcome. Um, but there are so many ways to really get involved and also to make sure that you're doing your part um, in our society to help our mission move forward. Uh, one tiny kind of teaser, uh, we are partnering with a wonderful group called Project Music Heals Us, um, and they have been helping us create a format here in Georgia where we will be live streaming um, concerts that will go into um, the rooms of patients who are healing from COVID-19 um, in hospitals that are um, predominantly um, affecting the Black community. And so doing that for people who are healing, who are recovering um, as well as for the healthcare workers who are really on the front lines, um, continuing to risk themselves, their bodies, um, their families so much um, to, to provide healing. So we just wanna be a small part of that mission as well. And we'll be announcing some of that pretty soon. So follow us, like us, and um, you'll be able to catch up on that work as well. And, and Jessica, any um, goals, future visions that whether within the board um, community or just as a musician um, that would be great to explore things that are on your mind as well? Um, I think that everything that I'm focused on right now is just about how can we connect more during this really difficult time. I'm really excited about this upcoming project and um, giving these concerts, these live stream concerts in hospitals. Um, and just being able to use artistry to, um, even though we cannot, you know, we can't physically hug each other or physically be in the same room together to be able to, I guess, um, do that in some other way. So I'm just, I'm looking forward to over the next, you know, months and, and, and the next year to figure out ways that we can connect more with our community in this really difficult Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your artistry, for being so open, and for connecting with us during this crazy, crazy, crazy time. So, <laughs> and for all of you that are watching, if you missed uh, any of our previous Founders Chats with the String Queens Decompose or Dr. Lewis Toppin, be sure to head over to our website, www.castleskins.org. Check out all of the archived conversations, and we have some other online video content for your enjoyment as well. Also, be sure to tune in next time, next week, same time, where we will have our what I don't even remember what number founders chat it is our fifth founders chat with the New York City based group we free strings so once again thank you challenge the stats and have a wonderful 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 day bye thank you thank so you much, so much. <laughs>